first wanted to say a few words about the brain and computation program uh, in general. And uh, the goal of this program is to bring these two fields, uh, computation, computer science, and neuroscience, um, together. They, uh, they have very deep ties in their roots going back more than half a century. Um, yet they've sort of grown apart and grown independently um, over the years in different, uh, different departments, different curricula, and so forth. And uh, many of us recognize that, uh, the, that these deep ties still exist, and this is, a, this is really an opportunity to, uh, to rekindle those and reformulate those by bringing uh, experts together from both sides, from neuroscience and from computer science. Um, there's three, uh, to, in addition to the boot camp today, there's three workshops uh, that will be um, taking place as part of the program that are posted on the website. Uh, a few words about the, uh, the boot camp uh, today. It's called the boot camp. Uh, no push-ups required, but, uh, but you will be uh, mentally expanding your horizons here, right? So mental push-ups in terms of like learning, stretching your brain and learning, learning about something new. That's really, that's really the goal here. Uh, we've, uh, we've, uh, and so, they, so yeah, the idea is really that uh, in, in the boot camp to introduce the, the fundamentals uh, from both sides, from computation and from neuroscience, and that this will form the basis of collaboration um, and interactions that will occur throughout the term. Okay, but to do that, we really hope to sort of have to get up to speed on a lot of stuff that um, any of us don't know about yet. Uh, we've asked the speakers to uh, to keep these two talks tutorial in nature and specifically given them the instruction that, uh, that experts in their field uh, should be bored. Uh, so if, if you are bored, try not to look bored. Uh, and then you'll just encourage them to say something more exciting to entertain you, right? So this is meant to, to be really uh, tutorial in, in nature. And uh, okay, so the, the, the program, the way we set it up is to really kind of have alternating days of neuroscience and uh, computation. So today is on the neuroscience side, starting from the cellular end, uh, Jeff Lichtman, uh, talking about connectomics and looking at uh, sort of wiring and detailed connectivity in, in the brain, and also uh, large scale uh, databases in neuroscience. This is from the, from the Allen Institute. Uh, tomorrow then we'll uh, move to the co computational side. So Bartlett Mell is gonna be telling us about computational models of single neurons, basically the biophysics of computation, and Wolfgang Maas on computational models of, uh, of neural circuits. And then, uh, and then on uh, Thursday, we'll switch back to neuroscience with uh, Murray Sherman uh, talking about the thalamocortical system. And the afternoon, Lena Ting talking about motor systems and myself on, uh, on vision. And then uh, on Friday, uh, it's sort of uh, back, to, back to computation. And we're kind of sort of moving from the cellular side to the, to the grand and sort of theoretical big picture questions. So Christoph Papadimitriou is going to give us a, a kind and gentle introduction to theory of computation. Uh, and uh, <laughs> it will be boring to the computer scientists, right? <laughs> and, uh, and then uh, Santosh Bampala um, also taking his, uh, that same idea, but taking it in the realm of machine learning as it relates to uh, computational neuroscience. And, uh, and then uh, Peggy Series, who's going to be talking about <coughs> Bayesian, Bayesian models of perception and cognition. Okay, so that's, uh, that's what's ahead uh, this week. Uh, so, uh, Today's speaker, uh, it's real, real pleasure and honor to have uh, Jeff, Jeff here with us. Uh, I think the uh, best way to introduce Jeff is from something he said in an article, I, uh, interview I recently read with him. And what he said is, I really like looking at data. Okay, uh, so that, that sort of says it all. This is, this is, this is where, uh, this is what he likes to do, look at data. And so what he's been spending his career doing is getting that data, basically just uh, perfecting the techniques that enable to us to peer into the brain and look at uh, brain structures on a very fine scale. He uh, did his graduate work with Dale Herbs at Washington University in St. Louis. And uh, I think that was his, your first faculty, faculty position there. Um, and where he was really an early um, developer and pioneer of the two photon imaging techniques, um, applying that method to studying the neuro uh, development of the neuro neuromuscular <coughs> junction. And of course, that's, that technique is now really sort of bread and butter uh, standard technique today in many labs. Um, and, and now at Harvard University, <coughs> he um, uh, has been uh, doing all kinds of amazing things, but among them, they developed the Brainbow technique, which enables one to uh, have neurons light up in a variety of different colors according to which proteins um, they express. 
and he's going to be showing us lots of those colorful pictures today. So um, thanks very much for, for coming, Joe. So can everybody hear me? Thank you very much, Bruno. It's a pleasure to be here, especially this month, because Boston and Cambridge have been horrible. <laughs> Just awful. It's so hot here. I'm sweating. And it's been a long time since I felt sweat. It's so cold. Um, I am a biologist. I'm assuming most of you are not biologists. And so my goal, I think, is to give you a biological perspective of data uh, with the full understanding that I believe that biologists are inadequately trained to actually do anything with this data other than look at it. And it, when you say I like to look at data, you are literally correct. I like to look at data with my eyes. This is not the way to get deep insights probably <laughs> in neuroscience. They, they, you learn a good deal from looking, but there is probably in this data much more. And this is going to require a generation of what I would call neuroscientists, although you might call yourself computational biologists, uh, to look at data uh, in a more serious quantitative way. I want to begin um, with something that many of you probably are not fully aware of about biology, that there's two kinds of biology, and they're related in something uh, in a way that I think I have formulated, at least for myself, a new formulation. I hope you haven't heard this before. Um, to think about the way these two styles of biology are. And, and you hear a lot of biology that is of one style or the other, and you probably don't realize how they're linked. And this is uh, the science U. Does, has anyone heard of the science U? Great. OK. So I think this is my idea. It's not a profound idea. But it is an idea. And the idea of the science you here is that you, uh, is that in biology, there are lots of phenomena, things in the real world that are interesting, that a kind of biologist reduces to its elemental explanation. This is a, 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 a step on the way down where you understand the phenomenon by breaking it down. And then once you've understood it, this information is leveraged. You get the explanation, and then you leverage it uh, by gaining information and building up to a synthesis of using that information. This may seem very abstract, but I'm going to give you a few examples. And by the way, do interrupt me if anything I say is confusing. I'm sure there will be. Uh, rather than just having the questions at the end, just stop me. Because there, it's more important that what I say you understand than that I get through all my slides. So let's take an example. You, you probably know, if you took a high school biology course, that this guy, Gregor Mendel, discovered that the color of the flower of a pea was related to the colors of the flowers of the parents' <laughs> peas that he was putting together. That there was some kind of inheritance of color that came from parents. And it wasn't just in peas. It's also in people, of course, the color of your hair, the color of your eyes, etc. Uh, and that meant that there must be some physical basis for inheritance. And that led over hundreds of years, inextricably, to an atomic explanation of what the physical basis of inheritance was. And that was Watson and Crick's uh, discovery of the way DNA is structured. That was a tremendous form of reduction. And it gets you down to a basal level of atomic structure of DNA. And then that, once you've accepted that, then you might say, well, all the physical inheritances that go on in an animal are based on what is in that DNA. And then a field was born called genomics, where all that information is now played out for not just uh, different species, but even different individuals of one species. So here's the way down and the way back up. That, that's sort of straightforward. So some scientists are very much synthesizing information this way, and other scientists in the biology, biological realm are working very hard to get at mechanism. And people don't start their lecture and saying, yeah, I'm on this side of the U or this side of the U. You don't hear that. So you sometimes get confused about how, what kind of science uh, a computer scientist can be most useful for. Um, interestingly, on the way back up, uh, it's not just sorting out the names of each of the genes, but 
lots of discoveries are made, like repetitive non-coding DNA, maternal and parental imprinting, things that were not inferred on the way down that get uh, built up on the way up. So the synthesis actually generates new ideas, which they themselves can lead to other use uh, and other ideas moving on and on and on. So there's a lot more to this than just building up information. Another example is there are diseases, phenomena in the world. Doctors uh, and scientists, biochemists often uh, go to try to figure out what the disease is. They get the cause. And then once they have the cause, they get a treatment. That's another example of this U. Um, one more relevant maybe to computer science is that uh, perception is a phenomenon that humans undertake with our visual systems. Um, for some people, one of the deep insights into perception was this hierarchical arrangement that Hubel and Weasel discovered of the complex receptive fields emerging from simpler ones. This is not something I'm going to talk about today, but probably this will, in your vision stuff, you'll talk about. This idea has a lot of legs in the sense that it, it provides a way of thinking about perception as being broken down in a series of hierarchical steps. And that in, um, excited uh, computer scientists, and I think convolutional neural nets, to some degree, are inspired by this. So here's the way down, and here's the way back up. And a lot of artificial learning uh, can be traced back to these ideas. One I'm most interested in uh, is that the brain is itself uh, not a homogeneous piece of protoplasm. It's made up of individual entities known as cells or neurons. And one of the reductions that is very interesting about these is the fact that these cells are connected together in a directional network. And this is Cajal's law of dynamic polarization. I'm going to explain this in great detail, so don't worry about it if this doesn't sound like anything right now. But this is the idea that nerve cells are not just connected willy-nilly, but there's a, 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 an idea behind the way they're connected. And if you accept that the brain is basically a big wiring diagram, then you would want to synthesize as going from DNA to genomics, going from these individual idea of connections to connectomics. And so this is where I see this field, uh, which I will describe uh, in, in good detail for you in a minute. Uh, and who knows, as one begins to describe these wiring diagrams, what will turn up that was not inferred already uh, from the work of going from cells to this wiring diagram idea. Everybody OK? Anyone confused yet? OK. So let's talk about uh, Cajal and what he did. So Cajal is sometimes called the father of um, neuroscientists. Uh, he certainly is the, uh, the mother of all neuroscientists. <laughs> he is the uh, beginner of the idea of neuroscience. And he, is a, he was a, a kind of visual genius. He used a very specific stain called the Golgi stain. And with the Golgi stain, which is a stain that is extraordinarily powerful by virtue of the fact that it only labels a very small percentage of nerve cells, but it labels those cells in their entirety, he could just by looking, and that's because of his geniusness, uh, he inferred something about the way nerve cells were connected. And here's an example of one of his drawings. The paper has gotten yellow, and he used white out. He's a very meticulous drawer, and he drew thousands and thousands of pictures. So ignore this white stuff here. That's just places where he corrected his drawings. And this is a Golgi stain picture of a piece of cerebral cortex um, where these objects here are nerve cells. And this thing in the middle of each of them is their nucleus. Every cell has a single nucleus. And he has these wires going around. And you notice these arrows. The arrows were the brilliant. Thing. This, he was a stable genius, absolutely. He did, everything he did was really interesting. And this was one of his ideas. Now, this was not based on knowing about synapses or action potentials or any electrophysiology. This was just looking at the Golgi stain. And what he said is that nerve cells have little processes sticking out of them, these fat things here, which we call dendrites. And these dendrites are receiving 
information from axons that come from other places. So this arrow is from a wire from a cell somewhere maybe over here that has an axon that comes up here and branches and its branches overlap the branches of the dendrites of this cell and he inferred just by looking at the static dead material that these axons are probably releasing something on to, in some way to cause the dendrites to receive information from the axon the dendrites then send that information to the cell body of the cell, and then the cell body has a single process coming out of it, which is another axon, like this one. That axon goes up and touches the, in this case, the apical, the highest uh, dendrites of this cell. It's a pyramidal neuron. That's the name of this kind of cell. And that information then flows into that apical dendrite towards the cell body. And here's another axon that uh, touches the more basal dendrites of the same cell and it also sends information into this cell body and together these inputs somehow collaborate to generate a signal that leaves this cell out its axon. That axon touches the dendrites of this cell, that information flows out its axon, that axon also touches the dendrites of this cell and that information flows out that axon. And here in one fell swoop was his theory about the way nerve cells talk to each other. And no one had ever said that before. And it's not a hard idea. Uh, almost anyone can understand it in a rudimentary sense. And uh, to this day, it is a very powerful way for thinking about the nervous system. This was his big idea. And even though this was done in the 1890s, I think most people today still think about nerve cell connectivity something like this. There's many additions to what he saw. For example, all of this is pushing information forward. There's no inhibition in here, and we now know many of the connections in the nervous system are designed actually to shut cells up. This cell, for example, is more likely to be an inhibitory neuron that's not trying to encourage the cell to send information, but trying to keep the cell silent. But he didn't know that, um, and so there is no inhibition in these drugs. Now, this big idea has a big implication for thinking about behavior. You probably already could infer this, but uh, Cajal made this explicit. He said behavior is basically a chain of causality of information going from sensory systems out to motor systems. So in this drawing, he said here's some skin that has sensory endings in it of, of a kind that send information into the brain. Here's the cell body. And so the information, if you scratch the skin or you put your hand on a hot plate, that information goes in through a particular type of nerve cell into the spinal cord. And some of those processes go up into the brainstem where they touch the dendrites of brainstem neurons. And those neurons send information up into the cerebral cortex where those axons touch the dendrites of pyramidal neurons. Those pyramidal neurons then send the information back down to the spinal cord and touch the dendrites of motor neurons. And those motor neurons send their axon out and cause muscle fibers to contract. And this might be why you would pull your hand away. Uh, it would be on the same side in that case. But, but it, this would be the kind of pathway where a sensory stimulation would give rise to a motor output. You could uh, generalize this and say you're driving along and suddenly the light turns red and information forces your leg muscles to push on the brake. It's the same idea. And again, to a first approximation, many scientists think this is a reasonable approach. Although clearly nobody has seen this to occur over this long a distance, but there is not a better sort of general idea at the moment. But but that doesn't make this true. It just means it's the hypothesis under which modern uh, neuroscientists, at least biologists, uh, believe information flows. Is this OK? So what are the fundamentals of this idea? So I just want to go through uh, four principles. They're axioms of neurobiology that have come from Ramoni Cajal's influence. He was a, a Spanish neuroscientist. And the Cajal's method, the Golgi thing, was an Italian neuroscientist. Cajal and Golgi shared the Nobel Prize, but hated each other uh, completely. And 
Uh, if you want to read something funny, you could read Golgi's Nobel lecture where he simply says Kahala is a complete idiot and completely <laughs> misinterpreted all the Golgi stain uh, material. So it, I would say even at the beginning there were controversies, but, but we remember Golgi for the stain, not for disagreeing with Kahal, and we remember Kahal for, Kahal for these lasting influences, these axioms of neurobiology. Axioms in biology are not like axioms in mathematics. You can have exceptions, it's no problem. They're just sort of, we call them axioms that they're not axioms. <laughs> but here are the axioms. The first is that the basic unit of organization of the brain is the neuron. This is uh, one of Cajal's terms, the neuron doctrine, that information flows from neuron to neuron to neuron to neuron in some kind of cascade. That's the first idea. The second is that the nervous system is not made up of one type of cell that's just interdigitated with itself over and over again, but that different kinds of neurons have different shapes. I've already shown you the pyramidal shape of the pyramidal neuron, that sensory neuron had a weird shape where the cell body is sort of sitting out off to the side and the information flows from the skin into the central nervous system and sort of bypasses the cell body. Uh, it, and that there must be many types of cells in the brain. All of these are neurons, but they each have their own local structure and connectional information that make them separate from other types. <coughs> The third idea, which I've already talked about, is this law of dynamic polarization, that axons send information to the dendrites. Sometimes they send information right to the cell body. And then the information flows out the cell's axon. So it comes into the dendrites via the axons of other cells. And then it goes out the cell's own axon to touch the dendrites of other cells. That's the law of dynamic polarization. OK. And then finally, that the brain is not just a random set of connections, but that there are canonical circuits. Canonical as in the word canon, that they are the same in one person as opposed to another. People are interested in what is the canonical circuit in the cerebral cortex, or in the visual system of the cerebral cortex, or in the hippocampus, or in other parts of the brain. What are these canonical circuits? These are axioms um, that a lot of people are after getting the underlying details about. I am not expressing my view about these. I don't think, just because they're his, they're not my personal ones. Uh, and you may get to hear me poop on virtually every one of these before the end of it. <laughs> today, but, but I want you to understand that this is where neuroscience believes, uh, based on Cajal at least, uh, there's food for further analysis. And so if one wants to deal with all this, uh, one's going to have to map out all these wiring diagrams. Uh, and that's this field known as connectomics. This word connectomics is maybe unfamiliar to some of you. Maybe by now you've heard of it. This is the dictionary definition from Merriam-Webster's Unabridged 2019. Uh, when we made up this uh, definition in 2008, uh, we thought, you know, maybe there's a chance this will be in the dictionary by 2019. I don't think it'll be in the dictionary by 2019. But, but this is the idea of connectomics. It's sometimes pronounced connectomics. Other uh, neuroscientists pronounce it connectomics. It's a singular noun, but plural in construction. So it's like economics. It's got an S at the end, but it's a singular. And it's a branch of biotechnology concerned with applying the techniques of computer-assisted image acquisition and analysis to the structural mapping of sets of neural circuits, or even to the complete nervous system of selected organisms using high-speed methods. You'll see why high-speed is necessary. And organizing the results in databases. And by databases here, you know, for a biologist, an Excel spreadsheet is sort of like, that's a database. But I think we, ha I think we have to go well beyond that uh, for data like this. Uh, first of all, it's images, not simply numbers. So it's complicated to put this in databases. But this is your challenge. Uh, and with applications of the data, as in neurology or psychiatry. So for example, you could have wiring diagrams that are abnormal. 
Those would be connectopathies, another word in this dictionary of the future. Um, and you, where you would want to say that autism, let's say, is a connectopathy. And here's the connectional aberration uh, that gives rise to that disorder. Um, and fundamental neuroscience, well, if you learned uh, what your grandmother looked like, and if I say think of your grandmother, a uh, picture of her comes to mind, somehow one might imagine that that's built in to the wiring diagram now. And that's a fundamental question that is not answered. How is information about the world instantiated into a wiring diagram? So that's a fundamental neuroscience question that could come out of connectomics. And I, I made this definition by looking up the definition of proteomics and genomics. So that's why it sounds that way. Uh, and the connectome in this definition might be the full wiring diagram of a whole animal or a part of a nervous system. OK? No questions yet? You all confused or it's too, it's, you're not bored yet. Yeah, mostly not sleeping. OK. So the aspiration of connectomics is to explore these fundamental axioms that I just mentioned. Uh, for example, the brain's made up of a lot of cell types. Well, if you could see every single cell, you would learn every single cell type, at least as cell types manifested in terms of their shape and their connections. So aspiration of connectomics is to answer the question of how many cell types there are in the brain. You could acquire the complete canonical circuit of any part of the brain you wanted at the level of synapses. And this is very different from what at present goes for a reasonable circuit, which are these hypersparse cartoons neuroscientists draw to get uh, a sense of how a system works and get the actual physical instantiation of behavior as opposed to these hypersparse cartoons. Let me show you what a hypersparse cartoon looks like. They don't look bad. Uh, this is one from Rudolfo Yinas and colleagues. It's, it's actually, a, to some degree, reasonable. It's very Kahalian. These are cells in the thalamus that send their axons up to the cortex. See these arrows? And these axons make synapses onto the dendrites of pyramidal neurons. And the information flows out of the neuron, out its axon, back down to the thalamus. And he's added now, because we now know these exist, not only the direct connections, but these inhibitory interneurons, these feed-forward inhibition circuits as well. So here is a hypersparse cartoon. This is not what the brain actually is. This is a human attempt to turn a massively complicated wiring diagram into something that's uh, digestible by a human brain. And that is a question whether that's a reasonable thing to want to do, but this is what everybody does. So you see drawings like this all the time, all through the nervous system. And this is not just an issue of sort of the nervous system being a place where complexity has forced us to come up with a simple code for what might be much more complicated. For example, this neuron might do 5,000 cells uh, of connections, not all of which are doing the same thing, and contact inhibitory neurons that do many, many things in addition to this. All that's hidden from view because we don't know about it. So we get these simple ideas. But it's not just the nervous system where simple circuits replace actual circuits. Another example is in molecular biology, a field you're probably not too familiar with. Sorry, can I have a question? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So like in the previous uh, picture, so what gives them the confidence to draw these kind of pictures, just doing statistics? No, they, somebody recorded from this cell mm -hmm. and maybe recorded from this cell and then stimulated this cell and found inhibition on this cell. So it's just for really specific, they're not doing big statistics on... Uh, well, they might have done it 20 times, and so they say there's a probability of that kind of connection. Okay. But this is not what the brain looks like. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> if it did, we could get away with a... We wouldn't need you. Even biologists could understand this. Yeah? Just, a, I guess, a quick question, almost like kind of diagrammatics. So the, the kind of connections between these different, different cells, and they have different shapes, which are indicative of certain things, the way the lines are connected, since they're not touching, like I'm sorry, thinking like an engineer, are these like capacitively coupled? These are synapses. I'm going to go into gory detail about what these are. They're called synapses, and they are not, in most cases, they're not actually touching. There's a little gap between them, 
and there's a chemical called a neurotransmitter that's released by one and binds to receptors on the other side. There are a couple that are actually melded together, soldered together, called electrical synapses, where there is no chemical interface. But most of these, all of the connections shown in this are chemical synapses, of wh which the majority of synapses in the cortex are chemical. But not exclusively, some are electrical. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, so if you're interested in performance, maybe a simple diagram like this might be enough to do what a very complicated neural net might do. And is it your opinion that you have to map it exactly as the brain? Well, I guess the question is, if this worked, this, in terms of energy, this is a lot, lot easier to do than what the brain actually does. So why is the brain going to all the trouble of doing it so much more complicated than this? And chances are it's because this isn't correct. This is a human idea of what the brain is doing, and it's consistent with data. It's not wrong. But, but when new data is generated, which it often is in connectomics, virtually all the time, what's seen is different from what these models suggest. And, and all they do is add complexity. It's not like they erase something. They just add a million things that you didn't know about. And so that suddenly it's not so straightforward that you have this loop. This is a simple loop. It's, and loops are complicated, but this is a simple loop. But it could be a far, far more complicated loop. But, but most neuroscientists will throw you know, rotten tomatoes at me just for saying this, because this is their bread and butter. This is the way neuroscience works. This is tractable in that there are thousands and thousands of papers written on this approach. This is the paradigm. We're talking about a sh paradigm shift of starting to get real circuits. Yeah. If, if we were to build a brain, it yeah. would look like that. Right. But what you would be building a brain with is with your brain. right? And, and it's a common mistake, I think, to assume that the logic of the machine you use to think is the same as the logic of the output of a brain. It's not that way. It's far more complicated than what comes out of a brain, in my view. And this is the challenge. It, it's, it, it defies simple understanding, I think. But we'll, we'll come back to this several more times. Yes? What is the evidence of Dirac canonical circuits? <laughs> Wishful thinking. I think there, there I mean, there, there is a hope that there will be some meta level of explanation that will allow us to not have to worry about every single synapse and everything is different from every other thing. There is a hope. And let, let's take it for the idea. Let's say you were interested in cities. And you go to New York, and you go to Boston, and you go to Paris, and you go to London, and you notice a lot of these cities have big rivers. And you start to say, oh, there must be a canonical city circuit that works. And you look at each instantiation as a little different, but you try to come up with some meta logic that explains all these cities. Could a human do that? Absolutely. Would it be correct? I don't think so. Because these cities are based on many, many, many things besides just rivers. You could have looked at it in another way and found they'd be very different. I don't, I don't really know. But this is the challenge of whether there are canonical circuits or where everything is different in every single brain. I don't think you're arguing against canonical circuits. I think you're saying this circuit is too simple. I mean, you don't believe that if you look in the visual cortex and you move one 100 microns to the right that the circuit is completely different. No, no. So you do believe in canonical circuits. You're saying this is a drastic oversimplification, and you're going to show beautiful pictures to prove that. Um, but it's, you know, so the problem still exists to figure out what that little chunk of cortex is doing. Yeah. And, and it can, you believe, be done eventually. Yeah. I mean, I think I, I'm, I'm slightly more nuanced about this than that. And that is that there are two forces at work in generating the structure of a nervous system. One of them is genetics, and one of them is experience. And the genetics generates a brain with 
cells that look like pyramidal neurons and cells that have particular neurotransmitters and perhaps that a cortex that has particular layers. And that often is said, well, therefore, we should be able to get the canonical circuit. On the other hand, what's built into a brain of a mammal, especially a human being, the vast majority of the wiring is related probably to what you've experienced in life. As most of your behavior, most of your repertoire is not intrinsic, but is learned. That wiring diagram is probably different between every one of us and may exist no matter what the original genetics were. You would still have a wiring diagram. You, you listen to these birds that can imitate human speech perfectly, amazingly. They're not using a cortex. They don't even have a cerebral cortex. And yet they have the wiring to generate the motor output based on sensory input of speech that's just like us. So I'm not sure the canonical circuit is really the right thing we should be looking for anyway. Because I'm not sure that's telling us anything other than the historical antecedents that generated a brain that had layers rather than having the functional, interesting ability to instantiate information. So. Yeah. I'd like to make a comment on, on the word circuit. OK. And here you think of this as a circuit. To me, this is just a very, very minor part of a real circuit that does interesting computation. You are right, of course, because What's driving this is coming in from somewhere else. And where this is going is somewhere else as well. The brain itself is an extraordinarily interconnected set of cells. So that if an ant bites your toe while I'm talking, if he bites my toe, my entire consciousness can be forced to attend to my toe where only one or two pain fibers were activated. So it's massively interconnected. And this is just a, a little eddy current in this vast thing. And this itself is an oversimplification. So I, I don't have any argument with that either. OK? So in, in molecular biology, you have the same idea that you go from receptor tyrosine kinases that activate a molecule that activates another molecule that activates RAS, which is a molecule that phosphorylates RAF, which then phosphorylates MEK12, that phosphorylates ERK, and that inhibits MEK. And so you have these little currents. Of, oh, yeah, it all makes sense. This is, again, the, this is the, the uh, coin of the realm, I think, for molecular biology. But again, it's a complete under rendering of what's actually going on, how much fan in and fan out there is at each of these steps. And people want to get full transcriptomes of exactly all the molecules involved. But as soon as you do that, again, you get into a computational problem. It becomes more complicated than these hypersparse cartoons. Another goal, and I've sort of hinted at this, of, of doing connectomics is and looking at is just to look at the ultrastructural data per se, look maybe with more sophisticated techniques than just your retina, um, to seek new biological regularities. So rather than just making wiring diagrams, can we learn things that we didn't know existed before? And so in uh, here we go. So in principle, for me at least, connectomics is a bottom-up approach. It shows what is there physically in the brain, independent of what theories exist. It generates the data upon which theories can be generated in response to it, as opposed to simply being there to test whether the theories we already have are correct or not. And this is, again, an area of tension right now. I think most people who are doing connectomics are not doing it from the bottom up. They have some theory about how the brain works, and they're using connectomics to confirm or refute that theory. But there is this other idea in science, in biology, this inductive idea that description, per se, reveals things that you didn't know about. And those things it reveals generates a new round of hypothesis. And I think I'd like you to keep that in mind as well. It's a place where, again, computer scientists could be very, very useful in how to turn this information into data that could be used to generate knowledge from the bottom up rather than just test hypotheses 
that already exists. Okay, so does this make sense? Does connectomics make sense? And I, I mean this in two senses. One is, as you're going to see, it's extraordinarily expensive and difficult to do this kind of work. And secondly is what you get out of this, is it sensible? <laughs> you, you get out information, but information and understanding are not the same thing. So what does it make? It definitely makes data. Connectomics makes data. But does it make sense? Does it make things that make sense? At the moment, I would say mostly not. It makes something that's scary in the sense you see complexity it, with all of its warts hanging out there, and you just can't turn it into some simple theory. Um, I'm going to go a little bit more into why this is so hard in the nervous system to get simple theory out of connectomics. And that's because compared to all the other organ systems in the body, the relationship between the physical structure of the brain and its function, what it does, is much more complicated than anywhere else. For example, all organs have cells of different types. In the kidney, there are nine or 10 types of cells. In the liver, 15 types of cells. But how many types of cells are there in the brain? A hint at how many is, comes by just looking at one organ, which is the retina. This is a picture from uh, Maslin's paper in 2001. Uh, and this, at that time, there were 39 distinct types of cells, of neurons, in the retina. That number is more than doubled now. And with connectomics, that number is increasing even more. There's just, even in this one little part of the brain, which is just the sensory reception of light, that place, there are a huge number of different kinds of nerve cells, ganglion cells, amacrine cells, bipolar, horizontal, and photoreceptors. And these are different types of amacrine cells, different types of ganglion cells. And someday, probably not too far in the distant future, we will have pretty close to a complete list of all the cell types in the retina. Sorry. But yeah. What do you mean by type? Yeah. So in this case, type is. For example, a cell that has a shape where its dendrites are found in particular layers. See, this cell has got uh, dendritic, the, the axon is here, dendrites in many layers, whereas this one in a narrower layers, this one only in the top layer, this one only in the bottom layer, this one in two narrow layers, this one extends very long. Each of these cells has a different shape. And when people record from these cells, they do something slightly different with light coming in to the eye. So there's a whole bunch of different types. These are the output cells of the retina that go to the thalamus and uh, the superior colliculus. All of these cells have different function. And the same true for the amacrine cells. They have different shapes. They connect in different ways. Bipolar cells, horizontal cells, and photoreceptors. Photoreceptors are only three types because we're trichromic, one for each color. But uh, there is this menagerie of cell types. That's what I mean by that. Okay. Is that OK? Even the same input, they will have different outputs or something like that? They, I, well, I'm not going to talk much about the visual system. Are you going to talk about retina at all? Yeah. I mean, you, you basically have information coming in that's both related to the dynamics of things moving, the color, the contrast, the shape, is something looming, going away, moving across the field. These cells are tuned to deal with different parts of the visual scene, not different places because they're all tiled over the entire retina, but they extract different kinds of information out of the visual world. Yeah? How did you figure out um, that they <coughs> react differently like, to different information in the visual scene? Like, is experimentally put the thing There are thousands and thousands of experiments on, on this. People take a piece of retina from certain animals, <laughs> rabbit or axolotls, salamanders, where the cells are big. They record from them and shine light and see how the cell responds. And then they have, there's been some anatomy, including EM, showing which cells are connected to which other cell types. Some of these are inhibitory. Some of them are excitatory. So th there is uh, probably 50,000, no, maybe that's too many, 20,000 papers on the retina. Okay, so there's a, there are many, many scientists have spent their entire career working in retina and ha don't feel like, well, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> Every day they feel there's more to do. It's a remarkably complicated and highly evolved system to extract information about the visual world. Yeah. Does the more 
morphology, morphology tell us anything about the chemistry of these guys? Because their chemistry isn't the same. Yes. Uh, well, the, their output chemistry of all the ganglion cells, they're, they're all. Among the, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there are, there's cholinergic synapses, there's GABAergic synapses, and there are glutamatergic synapses. Three different neurotransmitters are common in the retina, and some of these cells are are doing one, one or two actually are doing two types of neurotransmitter, very unusual in other parts of the brain for the same cell to have more than one neurotransmitter. But yes, there is detailed information and genetics. Uh, there are genetic differences between these cell types. This is not a learned wiring diagram. This is one of those intrinsic wiring diagrams designed by nature to allow a young animal to begin to be able to address what the world means by having sensory perception. All this. And this is true in fish and mammals. Birds are all very similar in this regard. Vertebrates, vertebrate retina. Okay, so that's one issue. You're going to get the whole menagerie from the retina, but then you go to the cerebral cortex, completely different set of cells. You go to the amygdala or the brain stem, the cerebellum, the spinal cord, autonomic ganglia, the enteric nervous system, and the gut. Every one of those places have their own set of nerve cell types. So there's an extraordinary diversity of cell types. There's nothing like this in the rest of the body. So can I throw another question? Yeah. So the diversity, do you think the diversity, I mean, do you think the diversity is because of the need to wire them in a certain way or because it actually matters that they function in different ways? I mean, is this just a way of, of are they diverse because nature, would similar circuits, you know, that have different component neurons, maybe function exactly the same, even though they, you know, these are different neurons? Parts of the body facing the outside world, like the retina, are evolving to take information in that the animal needs to survive. So, for example, if the animal needs to be able to see a circling hawk and have enough resolution to tell the difference between a circling hawk and a circling duck, uh, and, and chicks can do that, automatically can do that, you have through the eons of evolution built a wiring diagram that does this. And it turns out the evolution of such wiring diagrams generate diversity. So in terms of shape and what these cells are. I don't know why, I don't know exactly what the engine of that is other than if they didn't have that mutation to cause that extra diversity, they would have gone extinct. So it is a kind of natural selection of complex wiring diagrams. Right, but I think I'm, I'm, I'm more wondering if we really need these thousands and thousands of different types of cells other than as a way of creating the connectivity. If this is, uh, you know, if I look at a, you know, at a computer circuit, I could just decide that different types of transistors were actually different just because they were kind of looked a little, you know, and I would find similarities, and these would be just wiring issues, fabrication issues. I mean, in the, in the retina... Issues, but they do the same thing. Yeah, in the retina, the photoreceptors that respond best to red light, green light, and blue light, not exactly, but, but roughly, there's overlap, but those photoreceptors are in different cells. So there's a blue channel, or a short wave channel, a middle wave channel, and a long wavelength channel. Biochemically, those cells have different rhodopsins. They are designed with a different intent. And you couldn't, select, you couldn't see those colors if you didn't have those three channels. If you're a deer, I think you only have two channels. And that's why people can wear blaze orange and not shoot each other, but the deer doesn't see them, because they're not sensitive to that color. And there are animals, I think there are some spiders that are four, are there other, are other animals that are four? Yeah, there are some animals that, are, that have four colors. Seven? Salmon. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, it's just, um, you know, evolution is an extraordinarily powerful thing here. And to say, why didn't they do it another way, is usually because this is the best way. If there were a better way, biology had plenty of time more than a billion years to come up with a better answer. No, but, but my, 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 my worry, my worry is that if we have to, you know, as computer scientists, make sense of 10,000 different types of cells, 
then that might be really, really complicated. But it tur if it turns out that these 10,000 cells, I could, could just categorize them, you know, and they're actually only five things that they all do, even though they're chemically different, they do five things, that would simplify everything. It would, it would, but, have, but, but why? We've learned this, but, no, and we've learned this from the world of processors, that you know, we can do things you know, the way Intel does with these complicated, yeah. uh, or we can do these kind of risk architectures, which are really simple. They do the same thing with less variability. Yeah. This is a 30 watt supercomputer, 30 watts, nothing. It's, there's nothing like it. Intel is really good. No, no, this I'm is 30 saying, watts. No, no, no. 30 don't, don't watts, a trillion no. synapses. No, I'm saying I think there's a reason it's done this way. Because saving energy is essential. Right. It is really important. And so that's one of the constraints. How to make the most efficient use of biology <laughs> may be to use many different components as opposed to in an industry where you want to use the same component over and over again. Correctly, we don't know enough to simplify it to that degree without thinking that we could be leaving something out very integral to the puzzle. That would be the way I would put it. Okay. It's dangerous to already assume most of this is unnecessary if biology thinks it is. So, is it understood what makes the cell differentiation process so robust that it creates these hundreds of types and you know interconnected in the most intricate ways? Uh, I'm going to tell you about one of the ways cells wire up related to experience, which is robust, but it is not related to genetics. When it comes to genetics, it becomes extraordinarily hard because genetics itself, that is the underlying inheritance that gives rise to these traits, is based on a network of genes, <laughs> which is also not well understood. So there's a deep you know, mystery after mystery after mystery, and you end up with this extraordinary complexity and you know you just grin and bear it. <laughs> so how far back do you have to go uh, to simpler uh, uh, life forms before you get fewer types yeah. in, the, in the brain? So if you go down as far as C. elegans, which is a very small worm that has 309 or something like that neurons, it's a very, very small nervous system. It's only got 300 cells. The problem is, and the person sitting right in front of you can tell you this your own, who's been reconstructing these cells, is that the, these cells are not simple in any sense of the word. They've been hyper-evolved, so one cell probably has many functions. So they still do a lot, but they do it with as few cells as possible. The, it's very hard. You could go back to maybe um, these nerve net animals, you know, uh, the, the little medusa type animals where they just have a nerve net of single cells that are interconnected in a way that we are now just starting to reconstruct. I mean, these are happening, but I am not sure we're going to get the answer there either. I think one way to divide it is I'm interested in genetically based circuits, like canonical circuits in the cortex, like the circuit in the retina, or I'm interested in how information changes circuits, no matter what the cells are. And that might be more addressable because there's probably not an infinite number of ways to change circuits based on experience, even though there might be an infinite number of ways genetics have changed cells types. So one could separate these two fields at some point. So small animals, the networks are the same? They're, if anything, more complicated. <laughs> That they are not the same from one worm to the other? Well, yeah, well they are roughly the same from one worm to the, another. Um, during development, they change their wiring. But yes, there, are more can there is a canonical circuit, supposedly, in the worm. But it's not something trivial. It's hyper-connected. Cells are connected to many more cells than you might have done if you were the engineer, as opposed to nature. I sense a little panic in the room. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm getting that sense, too. <laughs> like um, 10,000 types, every one of them weird and different. So I mean, it's probably useful to point out in the organ that you study, or you most recently, and you know, actually, the cortex, let me just say that, that you know, 80% of the cells are more or less of one type. Or I, I don't want to overstate the similarity among different pyramidal neurons, but that may be a little provide a little bit of relief that if 80% of, of the total is pyramidal neurons and then 10% is a particular type of inner neuron and 
8% as this other type of interneuron, it's a little less uh, you know, terrifying. And, and the circuits have a great deal of regularity. If they didn't, you wouldn't study them. What would be the point of studying one dendrite if it wasn't anything like the next one over? I don't know the answer, actually, to that. I really don't. I mean, maybe you're right that it really is a tractable problem. But even if you reduce the complexity by a factor of 100, it would be an intractable problem. If you reduce it by 1,000, it would be an intractable problem. It's just fundamentally so much going on. I don't think it, you can reduce. Maybe you can say there are neurons that are excitatory and inhibitory neurons. If you know that, you can explain everything the brain does. Maybe so. I, I don't know. I, I doubt it. I think at every level, there's complexity here. And so to try to say, well, computer scientists don't have to worry about this too much because it's not that bad. I think it's worse. Not, it's worse <laughs> than we think. Not, not, no matter how bad I tell you it is, I think it's going to be worse. And that's the opportunity because there's no one else in the world other than a computer scientist who could deal with this. <laughs> I just want to add one comment. Computer scientists don't have to use a thousand types of devices to, re to build the brain once they understand how it works. They can use one type of device, a NAND gate. Yeah, right. So, you know, it's, it's the figuring out process that's made more difficult. But it's not like you can't build the brain with, unless you have a thousand weird types of objects. It's just, if you want to build a 30 watt brain, it may be that you need to absolutely select each and every element to be it's maximally efficient. And, and that's the magic of, of these brains that sit in our head. I know, we have 10 minutes. I've gotten through 1% of my slides, so. <laughs> I think you let, have to let Christos uh, yeah. ask his question, though. Go ahead. I, I, I didn't really make the table, but it was my Yeah, I mean, uh, to me, this is not, uh, even though we're, we're going slow, I think that this is the point. This is, that, this is the point, so. so I mean, you know, I sense that, 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 that we are trying to both motivate computer scientists and scare them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, uh, I want to tell you we are both motivated and scared already. Right? <laughs> and, and, you know, and one reason is that over the past five years, we have come across uh, 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 neural-like systems which, of which we know the precise uh, connector, we know the synaptic weights, to great uh, approximation, and we have no idea how they work. Uh, and I'm talking, of course, about you know, about deep nets. Right. So this is, I mean, no, we have. Uh, we're, you already, we're, already we're, yeah, we're right. Already facing right. You're facing it even in your own field, and even, and humans are to blame in this case. These were not. This is not genetics. It, it's truly a human-inspired development. Okay. So many different size scales. The brain is, another problem with brains is that it, it has you know, planning in the front, vision in the occipital lobe, balance in the cerebellum. So there's all this sort of macroscopic structure that is important for brain function. And then when you get up to a little area, factor of 10 bigger picture here, there's the gray matter where the nerve cells are and the white matter, which is unfortunately painted pink here, which is where the big axon bundles that connect cells from one part of the brain is to another. If you zoom up another factor of 10, this is what a single pyramidal neuron looks like. It can extend all the way from the bottom to the top of the cerebral cortex layer. It has all these dendrites, and then it has one axon going out. You zoom up again by a factor of 10, the dendrites are complicated in that they have a division of labor. They have these little things called spines sticking out of them and shafts where there are no spines. And there are typically different kinds of synapses on the spines and shafts. The spines get excitatory synapses that try to force information out of the cell, out its axon. And the inhibition uh, sits on the shafts. And its job is to basically short circuit any electrical circuit going down this way to shut things off. So there's inhibition and excitation. And when they're active is important. And then uh, at the level of a spine, there is finally the synapse. And now I show you actually an electron micrograph of a synapse. I, I see this very clearly because I look at these all the time. But I'm going to color them in to make it clear. This is a dendrite in cross section. Just cut so that this dendrite is in cross section. And here's the neck of a spine. It has a little apparatus in it. Those lines are significant. And then up against it is a cross-section of an axon. 
that's filled with these little circles which are neurotransmitter packets. They're synaptic vesicles, and those are the vesicles that release their neurotransmitter at this interface to cause an electrical change to take place in the dendrite, flow into the whole dendrite, and down towards the cell body. So this is the synaptic <laughs> connection, and this is a one-way uh, communication. That is, the dendrite is not changing the firing pattern of the axon here. The axon is changing the activity of the dendrite. <coughs> okay? So that's, you can see stuff like this. Uh, at high resolution, you can see every synaptic vesicle. But there's a problem here. And that is there's important information about the brain at every one of these levels. At this level, you probably know about this um, technique called functional magnetic resonance imaging, where the resolution, you get images like, uh, I don't think I put it in there. Uh, you get images that just have hot spots where the resolution of the image is one cubic millimeter. And a human brain has about a million cubic millimeters. And you can see where blood flow is at this one cubic millimeter resolution. At this level, you are resolving things at nanometers. This is a 500 cubic nanometer voxel, whereas this is a cubic millimeter voxel. This voxel is 2,000 trillion times smaller than this voxel. That is, if you wanted to get the full resolution of the wiring diagram at this level, you would need 2,000 terabytes or two petabytes for every voxel at this level of resolution. So a human brain, you would need two petabytes times a million, which is just, what, two million petabytes. Yadabytes. <laughs> what? Yadabytes. Yadabytes, is that what that is? Yeah. So that would give you a whole brain. That's a lot of data. I don't know how that compares with the digital content of the world, but it's up there. Yadabytes. Yeah. OK. So that's another, I'm not trying to scare you, but that's the reality of trying to get a whole wiring diagram of a human brain. Um, I'm going to, I, we have to take a break now. And I'll think about whether I'm going to talk about brainbow insights or go right to electron microscopy. I think maybe when we come back, I'll go right to electron microscopy. So we'll, we'll skip this development and just go on, if that's OK. So let's take a break for a half an hour. We can discuss more, and then we'll come back. <laughs>